I want to start off by welcoming everyone to the session tonight. It is great to be back with these in person. For those who were here last year, remember we tried to do three of these online uh, via Zoom. And although I thought that those were super, super helpful and informative, I didn't like it because all I can do is stare at the screen and see a little picture of myself as I talk for an hour and a half. So thank you for coming out. I just want to introduce the gentleman to the back here, for those that don't know, to my far right, uh, Coach Jordan. Jordan works uh, with the first team, USL League One team, USL League Two team, head coach the USL Academy team, and works in the MLS Next program on the boys' side. And to his left, Stefan. Stefan is the governor of Statesboro. If you didn't know that, hope you voted for him. He is head of the MLS Next program. These guys are along with myself. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Coach Jim. I am the head coach of the USL Women's team. Uh, as well as I run the girls' select side of the program. Uh, collectively, I don't, I'm not good at math, but who knows how many years of collective experience we have in the college game. Uh, it's a lot. So we're here to hopefully share some of our experiences, some things that we've learned along the way to give you some good information uh, with respect to the college recruiting process, uh, sort of where we are now, the landscape as it's been for the last 24 months uh, with the whole COVID thing, how that's going to shape down in the next couple of years, uh, and then uh, hopefully answer any questions that you may have, uh, and because we are your best resources through this process, uh, and I'm sure we'll talk once or twice or three times about the value added that we have here at Tormenta versus some of the other people who are calling you and contacting you through some of these tournaments that we sign up for, the NCSA or whatever, and so these people who are out there that want big money from you to give to them, who don't really do anything for you, no disrespect to those programs, but we want to help you any way that we can. <clears throat> right, in my short time here, I've been here 13 months. Hi, I mean, come on in. You come up front, hang out with the governor and Jordan if you want. Or you can sit over there with those guys. Do whatever you want, man, you're in charge. I mean, he's been here for two, two weeks. He's already in charge. Everybody knows Brad. Jennifer's in the back somewhere, so here's what we're going to do. Okay, we're going to try to, <clears throat> and I apologize for my voice, try to take you through, uh, sort of like we did last year on via the Zoom uh, informational, we'll take you through a couple generic uh, informational slides uh, with respect to college recruiting, and we'll get into some, some more specific things to talk about, but hopefully at the end of the day, we're trying to make this as interactive as possible, okay? Sorry. <coughs> Stefan, a little help. How do I get to the next slide? But... <laughs> Technology is my friend. Jordan, while we're waiting, can you put on a dance show for us? He doesn't like that. You don't want to see that. Okay, great. Yeah, that's all I wanted, so I did. <laughs> my apologies. <clears throat> For my friends who know me, they know I'm not very good at technology. Okay, but here's some of the things we're gonna cover tonight. We'll talk about the governing bodies. A lot of people go into this and they don't know the difference between NCAA, NAIA, junior college, and so on and so forth. We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll get you into uh, how many college soccer programs are out there. You'll be surprised to see how many there are. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about scholarships. <clears throat> Gets to that point, and hopefully we get as many of our players to have an opportunity to earn some athletics grade and aid. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, what you need to do if you're just starting the process. What do you have to do to research schools that hopefully fit your profile? And then uh, basically some things that we think you should be doing at uh, the specific year that you are in school. <clears throat> and then lastly, again, how we are here to help you. Nice. Okay. So for those that don't know, there's three main governing bodies. <clears throat> In college athletics, everybody is pretty familiar with NCAA. You know that's the, the the largest of the three. You know that's a lot of the big name schools that you see on TV, so on and so forth. Um, you know NCAA football. All right. You also have the NAIA, and that's what it stands for there. And then you have the junior college. I was fortunate to work at the junior college level uh, for a couple years in Georgia, and worked at the NCAA level for the rest of my career. Uh, I have yet to have any experience in the NAIA. Uh, but I know that that's, there's a lot of schools in the Southeast that are NAIA, and there's a lot of schools in the Midwest that fall under that national governing body. Okay, but those are the three main governing bodies. All right, just a little bit in terms of the difference of the three. All right, you sort of see what we have there. <clears throat> so NCAA broken down into three divisions. 
Division One, like I said, those are the, the Power Fives, the big name schools. Those are all schools you see on TV with football, basketball, so on and so forth. Right? There are schools at the Division Two level. The Peach Belt is a conference in this area that has that's very good uh, for men's and women's. A big Division Two conference in there. There's a couple other D2s, Conference Carolinas, and so on and so forth that are in this area. And then you have Division Three. Uh, you see that for the most part, major, mid-major, small colleges. Uh, Really, I mean, from, from my end, what do you have uh, with, with respect to this? Division ones, those are a lot of the bigger schools, the big scholarship schools, um, so on and so forth. Uh, Division three is a lot of smaller, uh, stronger academic type of programs for the most part. Emory comes to mind right there in Atlanta. You know, they're a big Division three program. NAI is pretty much broken down into two divisions. You'll see schools of varying sizes in there, but a lot of it is small to medium size. And then a junior college, you have the three classifications there, JUCO 1, JUCO 2, JUCO 3. JUCO 1, for those schools that compete there athletically, that's the division where they can offer athletic scholarships to all their student athletes. JUCO 3 cannot. I worked at Oxford Emory outside Atlanta there. They were JUCO 3, so even though we're under the Emory umbrella, we were not allowed to offer athletic scholarships to those kids. And then JUCO 2 uh, just started in 2020, and they can offer athletic scholarships. A lot of those schools, because they're mostly two-year schools, uh, are small and medium-sized in nature, and they're scattered all over the country. They have good presence in this area, too. Okay, Just in terms of numbers, you see some of the numbers. This this data is as of last year. All right, I did hear that there have been a couple men's programs that have popped back up, uh, but we're pretty close to where we are on the women's program. So there's the math. All right, so you see on the men's side, roughly 1,200 programs that offer men's soccer in this country on the women's side, a little bit more than 1,400, broken down into those categories. Any questions about that? All right, we talked about this last year, <clears throat> so I just wanna make sure that there's no confusion in this space, as we're actually talking to one of the female players uh, at the field today, that she's talking to a college in our region, and they're talking about scholarships, no scholarship money, so on and so forth. So here's basically, five really by definition what an athletic scholarship is as defined and classified by the NCAA, right? So you see that form of financial aid to attend the university based on your ability to play in a sport. That's it. That is it, okay? Uh, for, the, I guess for the purposes of NCAA and the academic institution, really what it goes by, and we always say, hey, she got an athletic scholarship, he got an athletic scholarship. It's really called an athletics grant and aid, right? That's what it, what it is called on the backside. Okay, for those who are fortunate enough to get that, that type of scholarship, that's what it can cover. It can cover t tuition, which it usually, usually does, but it can also cover room, board, books. Uh, they also have this thing called <clears throat> full cost of attendance. They see at the bottom, uh, that has just popped up here in the last couple years. Uh, when I was at North Dakota State, they had that uh, for their football program first. For those that don't know NDSU, they've been, I don't know, I think they won the FCS National Championship nine out of the last 10 years. So they got to a point, they were one of the first schools in the country to get to a point of offering full cost of attendance to all their athletes. So we even have with women's soccer. So basically we could pay, we can give the girls money for flights to get from hometown to Fargo, back and forth, money to drive players from where they live to campus, all right? So that's what they were offering there. there from, my, from my understanding, there's not a lot of schools that are at full cost of attendance scholarships just yet, but that's sort of the next wave, okay? Just so you know, anybody who is offered an athletics grant and aid, unless it is football and basketball, correct me if I'm missing anything for what you guys know, unless it is now football and basketball, right, the, the real true revenue sports, everybody else is on a one year renewable. So that means going into your freshman year, you have to sign your national letter of intent. After your freshman year, you're going to sophomore year, you gotta sign it again. Going into junior year, going into the senior year, going into your fifth year. For these people that have COVID years, you gotta sign it every year. Okay, so it is a one year renewable. You have to sign NLI, okay? And just so everybody knows, because there's a lot of confusion here, because you know, everybody said, I got a scholarship. Okay, what does that mean for the most part? For the most part, and this is you know, based on the statistics that we've seen, most, especially in our sport, most soccer players will receive a partial award, okay? Most will receive a partial award. All right, you will see in the women's space, based on those numbers that we talked about before, and I'll show you in the next slide, a lot of times in the women's space, you'll hear of more female soccer players getting uh, full athletic scholarships. On the men's side, it's rare, very rare, okay? Anything that 
you guys want to add to that? Any questions about this kind of stuff? Yeah, we're recording this and whatever you need. If you need this, uh, yeah, we, we, we said a lot of this uh, we did last year when we had the presentation, but yeah, we can easily send it to you. That's a piece of cake. Yeah, how does it work for some of the schools that don't offer, like, um, other schools that don't offer academic or athletic scholarships? Well, like Ivy League? Yeah, you're talking, that's it. So you're talking Ivy League, you're talking a whole new animal now, as of from what I've seen the last 12 months, 18 months. Um, I'm not sure if it's across the board with all eight schools, but I know Princeton and a couple others, they are now doing their own in-house, full, whatever you need, they're going to give it to you. It is a full grant, but it's all based on in-house endowment money. And it's not the one-year renewable? No. Thing? No. Because Ivy Leagues, if you, if you talk about sort of where we've been for the last 30 years in college athletics, all the Division I schools except for Ivy Leagues all could offer athletic money. Patriot League was the other conference that didn't. I went to a Patriot League school. Lafayette back in the day. So as Ivies and Patriots didn't offer athletic money, Patriot Leagues now do. Ivy Leagues don't still to this day, but what Ivy League has done is they said, anybody who is demonstrating need, we're gonna go meet it through our own internal uh, endowment. So it's an interesting avenue there now. So they said, if I'm someone who does well in school and I'm interested in I Ivy League, I'd be all over that, all over that. Tell me where you wanna go. Jim Barlow, I got him on speed dial. Oh, hey, uh I'm assuming you're the one we're talking about Ivy League, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. You know Jim Barley, no? Harvard. Harvard, okay, hell another guy. Nope. They got in trouble a couple years ago though. So Who? Which one? And then Stanford. No, yeah, Stanford's good school though. Not Ivy. If you need Princeton, let me know. Got Jim Barlow on speed dog. If you need Penn, I got Brian Gill, I used to coach Brian Gill. When he was at Ryder. You know, he's at Penn. I know the guy that dark. Hey Jim, how did the do the division division threes compete anyway? your experiences? What do you mean by compete? So, for example, I went to a school called Salisbury when I recruited there, when I was coaching there. Uh, York College, who was a lot more money, but lived in Pennsylvania, was in our conference. They would lower their fees for the school to whatever we, what our cost was, so that it would be equivalent, so the kid would then have to choose whether they wanted to go to Salisbury or York. Is that still a thing that D3s do? Well, you see that in a lot of schools now, that you're, like the whole in-state versus out-of-state tuition that we're familiar with, and that we sort of, we've been through back when I used to coach uh, at the college level, you'll see a lot of schools now that they'll match, they'll do like matching for the schools in the region or the schools in the five surrounding states that they're in. So a lot of what Brad's saying, you have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. So he's basically saying if school X Cost twenty thousand dollars a year, and school Y costs fifty thousand dollars a year, and I'm interested in both. Sometimes you, know, you can get school Y at the same cost as school X, but you got to go through admissions and financial aid and dig in a little bit deeper. But there are a lot of those schools out there that are trying to make themselves competitive to you know, against the other schools in that region. Well, they'll do some type of like tuition match. Even something. as Division Three, especially Absolutely. if you have a you have decent GPA and SATs. Yep. 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 For sure. Any other questions about anything from here? All right, just want everybody to know exactly what an athletic scholarship is by definition and sort of how it functions. You guys want anything to add? Okay, this is another one where these the rubber meets the road. Okay, this is this is where we are. All right, because again, you know, we're talking about Title IX. I saw some stuff this week. The uh, 50th anniversary of Title IX is happening this week. For those that aren't familiar, Title IX was actually enforced at the NCAA level in the mid-90s, and that's basically saying gender equity in terms of um, offering, athletic offerings, facilities, so on and so forth, men versus women, that women have to be equal to men. So really what happened is, here's how it shifted the soccer scholarship landscape for our sport specifically, right? You see the sort of this disparity there, and a lot of that is because of Again, we go back to NCAA football, NCAA basketball, the true revenue sports in NCAA because those guys have 85 scholarships, full scholarships on the NCAA football side, 15 <coughs> on the basketball side. In order for it to become equitable for Title IX purposes, you start to see that a lot of the women's programs are getting more athletic scholarships versus the men and in the non-revenue sports, okay? So that's why you see a little bit of this disparity. But on the men's side, you see NCAA Division I, the maximum amount of athletic scholarships that they can have is 9.9. .9. And the school does not have to have that. Like I said, I went to Lafayette. Lafayette to this day, 
2022 is about six and a half is what they offer, okay? So they're not even what they call fully funded, okay? But on the women's side, like I said, I was at NDSU, I was at LIU Brooklyn, Division I schools, we had 14 full on the women's side, okay? So that's how it breaks down. D2, you see nine, 9.9 .9 on the women, NCAA D3, no athletic scholarships whatsoever. And then you start to see NAI, we talked about that governing body, and then you see the JUCOs, how that works, okay? And the JUCOs, even though I put the uh, began 2020, uh, my understanding is that they're, I think they're either 15 or 18 right now. I just didn't update the slide. Any questions about that? But again, you go back and do the math on the 1,200 schools, 1,400 schools. You know, why do, why do people only get partials on the men's side? That's it. All right. It's just that's the, how the, the money is allotted. <coughs> right, talk about choosing a school. All right. And I get, everybody asks me this question. And, and I think we'll talk about this a little bit more as we get going. Yeah, Coach Jim, where do you think I should go to school? Where do you think I should play? I don't know. I have no idea. All right, I don't know what you like, but uh, here's some of the things that you should think about. All right, and I'll tell you straight up front. I went to Lafayette College. Division one program, no athletic scholarship money. This is back in the late 80s, early 90s. 2,000 people, that was it. And I went to a small private high school, much like we just were over there at Cavalry. So I went to a small private high school, 300 and some kids, eight through 12th grade. You know, my biggest class was what, 14 people in high school. I went to Lafayette. I got scared to death when I went to my first class. I had 80 people. I was like, "Whoa, it's huge!" All right? I just I'm not someone who liked big schools. My wife is a Rutgers grad. Rutgers had five campuses. You took a bus to get from campus to campus. Even back then, early 90s, 40,000 people. 40,000 people. So you got to decide. You know, where do I want to be? You know, I was a little bit more than an hour away from where I grew up. And so do I want big city? Do I want small town? You know, what's the environment that I'm looking for? I mean, I've been to University of Alabama for ODP Region Camp how many times? Oh my God, I love the University of Alabama's campus. Could I go there? No, but you walk by Jack Daddy Stadium, right? And you're like, this thing's massive, right? Been to Ohio State, Matt, you know, you go, is that what you want? Right? Is that what you're looking for? But you gotta be thinking about these things, okay? I know for the parents, if you look a couple slides down, all right? For the parents, these are the things that you have to think about, right? Is the hope if you're a Georgia resident? If what's the South Carolina one? The what's their academic tuition thing that they offer South Carolina residents? I can't remember. What, uh, drawing a blank on it. Right, but are those things a factor for you to stay in state? You know, if I'm a Hope Scholarship recipient, if I stay in state and go to a Georgia State school, I get X amount of free money basically from the government because I have a certain GPA. Right? Are those things factors for you? Right, sort of like Brad was uh, alluding to there. You know, a lot of the Division three schools tend to be private schools, right? So the tuitions are a lot higher, right? Some of the NCAA D ones, D twos tend to be public. Or I shouldn't say tend to, but there's a good handful that are public, so their tuitions are a little bit lower. <coughs> so those are things that you have to think about, right? So you, as the student athlete, remember it's your journey. We're here to help. But one of my sons went to Lafayette because he liked it. My other son didn't like it, and he went to a different school. All right. I think my wife wanted me to go to Rutgers, but that didn't happen. But those are things that you have to think about with parents' guidance, with our guidance. But again, these are the things that you have to consider on the right. right? I can't tell you how many stories I've heard in my life as a co 30 years coaching, how many stories I've heard in that upper right. All right I went to so-and-so school, and mm -hmm. guess what? The coach left, or the coach got let go, or whatever. All right? Don't choose a school because of the coach, because right? you're going to make a mistake there. Okay? Other one, all right, I've had kids who've gotten injured. It happens, I got injured, missed 18 months in my college career with eight knee hyperextensions, all right? What if soccer's not in the equation, all right? I mean, I know for a fact, when my son went to Lafayette, <coughs> again, there was a kid that came into his, with his freshman class, coach got through the freshman year, was like, eh, I don't like the way he plays. Just push kids out, pushed them out. I mean, morally, is that the right thing to do? No, I don't think so, but he didn't have a problem with that. But now the kid's gotta decide, this is the place I want to be now that soccer's not in the equation. Some kids transferred, some kids stayed. Okay, but these are the these are the sort of the harder conversations that you have to have as a family and think about these things. Okay, but again, this is sort of your starting point. I mean, we I mean, you guys are fortunate. I, I know I know with Jordan and Stefan take their teams away. We're going to some of these cool areas that there's a bunch of college campuses you know within close proximity to the to the site that you're playing at. Go take a visit. And we were just up there in Greenville a couple weeks ago. And you can go see Anderson's there, Clemson's there, uh, Furman's there. 
He goes, don't take a 20 minute ride, 30 minute ride. Just take a look at the campus. Mm -hmm. Between Anderson, Furman, and Clemson, three different type of environments right there, all within an hour of where we were at CESA. You may go to Clemson and go, I love it. You may go to Clemson and like, ooh, too big, way too big. You may go to Furman and go, yeah, it's too small. I don't know. Okay, but think about this. <clears throat> Anything for you guys? Yeah, no, I was going to say, Jim's done a good job of um, crunching this down. Well, for me, I think the four main things to consider is academically, does the school make sense? Does it have my major? Does it have what I want to study? I know we all want to be pros, we all want to move on, but the reality is that percentage is so small that your major, um, what you're studying is incredibly important. Okay, So does academics make sense? Athletically, does it make sense? Okay, do I want to go to a Clemson and understand I may redshirt my freshman year. I may not get minutes till my junior year. We have a boy, Tristan Deloach, who came through the academy. I think he's a phenomenal young player. Red, went to Clemson, redshirted. Now we're seeing um, in his redshirt freshman year, played nine minutes against Indiana yesterday. Um, but he knew that was his dream school. He's okay with that. Do you want to play straight away as a freshman? Clemson's probably not going to be the school for you, okay? So athletically, does it make sense? Academically, does it make sense? Does the school make sense? So like Jim said, touch wood, it doesn't happen. But if you break your leg and you can't play again, do you still enjoy the environment? Is the culture of the school what you want? Um, I was fortunate to go to Appalachian State University, which before I went, knew nothing about, but fell in love with the culture of the school, knowing I was fortunate enough to play soccer, but if that got taken away, I was more than happy to be around the campus and the culture of the school. And then the fourth one, which is the most important and ties everything together, is financially, does it make sense? Okay, and that's the biggest, um, Piece, I think parents especially want to take a good look at. Um, financially, does this school make sense? Okay, that includes your GPA scores, your SAT scores, your academics are going to be your biggest help when it comes to financials, when it comes to college. Okay, so I think athletically, does it make sense? Academically, does it make sense? The school itself, does it make sense? And then obviously financially, which is the bigger piece as a family that you guys have to weigh up. Um, but I think that's summed up in these four. But those are the four main ones I would say um, you guys need to consider. It, it, it just for me, we, we basically sum this portion up is basically called the concept of fit. Does this school fit my needs, my expectations, my wants? <clears throat> One of the things that you have to do as student is in your evaluation of a school, go to the roster. Are they selecting kids from your geographical area? That's, you know, are you coming from Georgia? Are you coming from South Carolina? Also, look at the pedigree of the types of players that might be at your school. They'll post if somebody is a junior U20 national team or a foreign players national team. Were they a high school All-American? And you have to understand that, you know, for that particular school, let's use Clemson for our area, if you don't have some of those particular accolades, it's not impossible to go to the school, but know that that's not the type of athlete that they're initially looking for. And the most important thing, again, I'll just triple head it, is ultimately it comes down to your academics because your title will be student athlete. And if you go there and you cannot sustain the academic requirements that keep you eligible, you will not play because if you don't meet what the school is asking you to maintain as a student athlete, you could be as gifted as any player in the world, you're just not gonna be able to play because you will find yourself academically ineligible. And that basically comes back to, again, the concept of fit. If you've never been in a classroom that has 200 people in a lecture hall and you need a professor that's going to give you one-on-one -on -one or a more intimate classroom, you may find yourself struggling if you're in political science and realize that you never get to speak to your professor. So basically, it's just all of this surmise is, is considered the concept of fit. Does it fit what will make me thrive? Any questions about this so far? All right, so we talked about the, on that last page. Okay, how do we get started? You know, someone like Gianna, young, ninth grade now, right? 
10th grade. Growing up so fast. I'm telling you. Growing up so fast. So how do I start the process? Okay, so you basically, you start from what we said on the last slide. You, know, you sort of take the, all those little things, all those ideas, okay? You know, my thing too, and sort of like where Stefan's getting, and I know Jordan talked about this on the academic side. I always like to try, or I say this, who's my money team? My money team for you as a student athlete. You know, obviously it's your coaches, your parents. You know, it's gotta be your guidance counselor at school, okay? They'll give you an idea of what may be a good academic fit for you based on classes you're taking, GPA, uh, test scores, so on and so forth, okay? So make sure you bring them into the equation so that we can get the, sort of the academic perspective. So talk to your staff here at Tormenta, okay? Bring them into the conversation as well. All right, I typically will not tell a player where I think she should play. I don't know that, all right? Who is the more determining factor of that? It's gonna be the college coach. The college coach, sort of to Stefan's point from before, or was it Jordan's point? I think it was Jordan's point. They will have an idea of what they're looking for in terms of a student athlete, what your profile looks like on the student side and the athlete side, and they'll let you know. All right, yeah, if your dream is to go to Clemson, whether it's on the guy's side or the girl's side, and you're emailing Mike or Eddie or whatever, and they don't get back to you, that's probably not a good sign, all right? That's, it's, they're looking saying that this may not be a good soccer fit. Okay, but I'm not gonna tell you that. I'm not gonna turn around and say, John, I don't think you should look at Clemson, because I don't know. I don't know what they're looking for, all right? Because you'll run into some of these things, and I know these guys can talk more about this too, is you, know, you could be in a situation where you could be a great player, right? You may wanna go to Harvard, but if Harvard's not looking for a right back in the class of 2024, it may not work, right? It may not work. Because based on what we said before, if they have a 25 player roster, X amount of money, and they don't have scholarship, whatever, whatever, you just may not be the position that they're looking for either. Okay? So those are the things that you gotta think about. All right? And I always tell everybody, this is sort of exercise for, hi, thanks for coming. You can sit up front with us. Also, you were able to sit down in the restaurant, I couldn't, I'd eat my car. Welcome to Christian's Dental. Yep. Front row tickets. So what I try to tell everybody is, and I did this with my own two kids, and they both played at the college level. You, know, you take all that information we talked about before as you're doing your initial sort of uh, scrub for what you're interested in, and create a spreadsheet. You know, get in there. Here's the school. Here's the, you know, the coach's information, first name, last name, email, office phone number. You know, I like to put in there what, what division are they? Are they NCAA, one, two, three, are they NAI, are they JUCO? You know, put some of those things in there because this is what you'll refer to when we start asking you to send emails out. You'll have all that information on there and you take a little tab at the top and be, hey, September 1st, I sent out the initial email with my player profile and my highlights. September 1st, send it to everybody. Okay, you may or may not hear back from some of these coaches depending on what class year you are and so on and so forth. Okay, you may get something back from somebody. Hi, they responded on September 5th. Put it in there. You turn around and respond, okay? So, so that's... For parents in the room, make sure you help your child. Children in the room, make sure you understand this is where you put the information. Okay? And then you start to create that list. Okay? People ask me, when do I start? And we got somebody on the, my 017, she's an 08, she's already started. Ninth grader, female, already started. Right? By definition, by definition, NCAA, this is what we're all talking when we take the test, okay? A recruitable student athlete happens when they enter ninth grade. Okay, the girls' cycle was crazy. It was crazy. I spent 12 years on the women's side. It was scary when you're going out to Wags, you're going out to Disney, you're going. I mean, name the tournaments that I've been to. I've been East Coast, West Coast. I mean, all over the place. And you go over to the U13 field, right? You try and take a break. You go to I mean, U13 is what? Seventh grade, something like that. And you just sit there, hang out, and you sit next to North Carolina, Ohio State, Auburn. So, yeah, the girls' cycle was crazy bad. They've slowed it down. The NCAA has slowed it down. But typically, that's what you get. All right, the girls, and you get, there's still people out there that are going to look at kids in eighth grade. I don't know why, but that's what they do. The guys, for the most part, happens a little bit later. All right, I said, you know, Brian's a good friend of mine at Penn. Dennis at Lafayette, they won't look at guys until pretty much going into their senior year. All right, they want to see the guys develop a little bit more become a little bit more physically mature. So the men's cycle is a little bit later than the girls' cycle. But for the most part, the trigger is once you enter ninth grade, green light go, as far as the NCAA is concerned. So my recommendation is, and this is sort of what we wanna talk about in this meeting and in subsequent meetings is, you don't wait. Don't wait and get, get going on it, get going at the right time, okay? 
but you see some of the other bullet points in there, right? Just know, hey, if you're someone like, you know, Lila, 08, email to coach. Yeah, they, college coaches can't get back to you. They cannot have contact with you until after that June 15th going into your high school junior year. All right, I've already had a side conversation with the one college coach, called me, talking about Lila. She can't call Lila directly, but she can call me. And I know those guys have probably had millions of those conversations, okay? But as I said, you can send out information as early as you need to. They may or may not get back to you, but just make sure you have an understanding of the, what the rules are, because if something happens, this is where the NCAA is, something happens, you're on the hook, all right? You could mess up your eligibility if the college coach makes a mistake. And I've, I've made that mistake once or twice in my life, where you don't realize what age the kid is, and you respond back, and then you're like, oh, now I gotta go take myself to compliance. It's like going to the principal. I didn't realize she was a sophomore. I actually con accidentally contacted her, and then we get reprimanded. But it, at the end of the day, we get reprimanded, but it could affect your eligibility. Okay, so just be aware. Any questions about that? Anything that you guys wanna to add to that? You guys are making this too easy for me. No, I think it's just the biggest thing is, um, and I'm sure we'll touch on this, is that you have to lead the process, okay? We're here as coaches, as a safety net, as networkers, but you have to sell yourself to these colleges. So if you're saying, okay, I wanna to go to Harvard, okay, am I going to a Harvard camp in the summer? Am I in front of those coaches? Am I emailing them? Do I have my highlight tape set? Do I have, have I been emailing them? Have I registered for the NCAA Cleveland House? There's a bunch of steps that go into it, um, but you have to understand, and I, I will be quite firm on this, that you lead the process, okay? Parents lead it, but the player leads it, um, the child leads it, but the parents have to be the support um, system for them. We are here to guide you. We are here for colleges to say, okay, what's he, I've spoke to, I'll use an example from last year on the 17 MLS next team, Stevie Barry, okay? Talked to North Florida about him. Um, they were at all of our games against SSA, because that was the best non-MLS next team that we played. Um, constantly now picking my brain because he went to their camp, he was in front of them. Um, and now they're coming to me for a character reference, which is trouble to touch on, but um, really, really important to understand that you guys lead the process um, we're here to facilitate that and to help with that, but the onus is on you guys to um, put, you want to play in college, be proactive, put your name out there, um, you know, you've got to market yourself correctly to all these coaches because as James touched on, Stefan, they'll be getting thousands of emails um, weekly, you get, you, from your coaching days, you get hundreds a day of emails that you have to cipher through from recruits, how can I stand out, how can I get onto the radar and arena? Yeah, no, just to, to piggyback really, really quickly is that um, there, I was a Division One college coach, and we literally can tell when a parent sends us an email versus when the kid sends us an email. And in all honesty, it's not a good sign that we're looking for kids that are going to be self-sufficient kids that are going to be self-motivated. And if we figure out that the parent is the one that's pushing the conversation, it's not a great sign because that's a telltale sign for us that either this kid's not mature enough to come to our university or the parent potentially wants this more than the kid. And if we do even take interest, um, we're probably getting somebody that the, it's driving the parents dream more so you know again parents and coaches we help to facilitate the process but back to Jordan's point it should be your child that takes the onus on themselves and is the one that is driving the process because we're not recruiting a parent we're recruiting the athlete and, and to Stefan's point and hopefully everyone's here because you want to play at the next level, right? That's your interest. Please understand, it is a super, super, super competitive landscape on the guy side and the girl side. Not, our, not only are you competing against everybody in our country that wants to play college soccer, you're competing with everybody in a lot of other countries that want to come to the U.S. and play college soccer, right? So the player pool all of a sudden is gigantic. And I think Stefan brought it up before, yeah, and I do this in my free time, because I enjoy it. Yeah, I'll go on somebody's website. 
You know, I watched, I told all the ladies, I watched I don't, 25, 30 games this week, all the rain outs, we have no training, so I've been on ESPN Plus watching women's games. I have to find players for our USL women's team, so yeah, I go watch these games. You know, I watched Notre Dame play St. Louis last night, so I go on their website. And I take a look at their roster. Where are these kids from? Right? Especially on the men's side. What are you seeing on the men's side? The shift has been a lot of heavy international recruiting on the men's side. That's just where it is. Where it is. All right. So, and you'll see, I mean, you still see it on the women's side. Not so much so. But for whatever reason, in the men's space, their mentality is why do I go, why should I go and try to find a domestic kid? Because it's, it's sexier, it's a bigger splash. Like when somebody goes on the website and all of a sudden they can see, yeah, I got the, the U20 Polish national team striker is playing for. Right, they like that. They like that. That's what they do. All right, I literally sat next to Bob Riasso, who used to coach at Rutgers back in the old days forever when Lawless was at, I sat next to him at a recruiting event. And that was his thing. Oh, I'm going over to Bulgaria next week to find a striker. <laughs> I'm like, Bob, you're in New Jersey. It's a great soccer team. Why do you have to go to Bulgaria to find a striker? That's just where they are. That's what they want. Okay? So you see it on the women's side a little bit. You see a lot on the men's side. So you just have to be aware. Very competitive, huge pool of players that we're dealing with. And, and like those guys said, this is a student athlete driven process. Now, this is not a parent driven process. I'll tell you honestly, I got emails from parents when I was at LIU and the issue. You know where that, what happened to that email you think? Delete it right away. Didn't even open it. Didn't even open it. I'm writing on behalf of my daughter. See ya. See ya. Okay? And I've, I've heard, I've been here a year. I've heard we've had parents here. In the year I've been here, oh uh, yeah, I emailed college coach for her. What? Don't, don't. Okay, don't do that. Don't do that, okay? And like Stefan said, th these are the things that need to come from the player in your verbiage, all right? Yeah, I can read an email and know that it was written by an adult. I don't know half the words that these kids say anymore. And I have two kids that are 23 and 22. I have no idea what to, but the coaches know. They know if you're writing it or if your player is writing it. Okay, we're here as resources. Parents' job is to make sure it gets done in a timely fashion. Don't be like, oh, you know, little Timmy's so busy, he's got to study for two tests this week. I'll write the emails for you, Timmy, it's all good. No, no, you just hurt that kid, okay? When it comes down to talking about money, that's when it's appropriate to ask the college coach, hey, can I get to the conversation now? A lot of times they'll invite you in, okay? But like I said, I will not call, I'm not gonna call for Madison. Hey, Jim, I'm interested in this school, this school. Can you call them? No. No, I'm not going to call them for her. But if she knows three or four or five schools that I know the coach and she's already done the work and sent the information out, right, that character reference type of conversation will happen on the back end. Okay, we had two of our kids commit to Anderson, right? Recently on the girls' side, I had the conversation with Sarah prior to that happening, letting her know, here's what I think of the players. Okay, guess what happens? Two days later, bang, commit, commit, money. That's how it works, All right? Both of them got athletics grant and aid based on the back end closing conversation that I had with the coach. That's how it works, okay? Any questions about that? So parents, push from the back. Make sure you know that we're here to help, but I'm not doing the work for you. Please parents don't do the work for them, but we gotta make sure that they get it done, okay? Here's what we sort of added for this one. We didn't talk about this last year, but as a staff, we decided. And uh, I know Tom. Oh, do you have do you have input in this, or is it all Tom? Tom. Okay, so Tom, he's our uh, assistant coach for the first team, head coach for our second team. He put this together, and I'll make sure that Brad sends this because he sent it up in a PDF, which has some other information in there that I didn't include because I couldn't fit it on the slide. Uh, but we'll make sure that we send that out to everyone. It's like a five pager. But here's basically what he. Put together, and I added a couple things in there just because I want you guys to have like eight more bullet points and everything. But here's what you need to do freshman year, sophomore year, these are the things that are important. All right, so if you have a notebook, write these things down. Okay, but these first two years, based on the time table that we said before, recruitable once you enter ninth grade, start the process, girls start earlier than the guys, boom, boom, boom. First two years, you should start that list, start that list, have an idea. All right, yeah, if you're interested in the Ivy's, great. All right, if you went to Greenville and you like those camps, great. If you want to go, go to Ohio State because it's got 60,000 people or Alabama because it's got a football stadium that seats 90,000, great. 
Start writing that list down. Put it on that spreadsheet with all that information. Start big, start big. 30 schools, 35 schools, the younger you are, okay? But like those guys were saying up front, Stefan and George, be realistic from an academic standpoint, an athletic standpoint. I was told players, hey, shoot big, shoot big. Why not? Let's say we had Leo Mendez. You know Leo from Statesboro? Goalkeeper? Yeah. Maybe before your time? Oh. But Leo lives down here in Statesboro. He was playing with us up at MOBA when I was at MOBA. You know, here's Leo. Right? I think, what is he? Is his family of Mexican descent, I think? So I think, I think he's uh, families of Mexican descent. So I got to work with Leo up there at MOBA. He was with our U19s, and then he was one of our goalkeepers for our USL2 team there. And he's like, I want to go to UPenn. I'm like, okay, great. So Leo, thank you, because most people don't want to leave Georgia. He's like, I'm going to UPenn. Great, guess what, I know Brian Gill. We had that conversation. Leo's now going into his junior year at UPenn. Dream big, dream big. He went for it, worked out for him. Okay, but be realistic. Be realistic. Again, based on the information you get from high school guidance counselor, based on the soccer information that you get from working with us. All right, let's create that list. Okay, but it's all based on that athletics, academics, location. Jordan, got, we got. Just to reiterate on building your list, start as big as possible. Don't limit yourself um, to saying, okay, I've got two schools. This is these are my two dream schools, and that's it. You have to be open to numerous things um, in terms of level. Academics, don't just, don't limit yourself to saying these are the only two schools I want to talk to. Um, we have a boy in our 19s who um, trained with us with the first team, um, fantastic player. He's targeted Division three, Junior College, Division ones. He's, he's, got, he's spreading his net far and wide. The more you do that, you might think, okay, I want to go, let's just say Georgia Southern is my dream school. But then you may visit a different campus and then there's a smaller Division two maybe and you think, you know what, this feels like the right fit. Um, because I've been to the campus, this is where I want to go. So just to Jim's point, identify your list, make sure you have your top 10 to 15. Don't, don't go with saying, okay, I've just got my top five, because that's just then going to limit you massively. Have 10 to 15 schools uh, that sort of fit the criteria that you want, which means you have to do your research, but don't limit yourself to just five to begin with. That can come later, um, later down the line. To begin with, have a, have a big uh, macro list of schools. And, and the list will be fluid. It will be fluid based on some of the things we talked about before. I said, all of a sudden, if you're interested in Dartmouth and they don't need an outside back in the 2024 class, well, if you still want to go there and they're not looking for you as a soccer player, well, that's what you have to decide. If soccer is the thing you want to do, then you got to take them off the list. And somebody else may pop in there, right? You may go to a game or a showcase or whatever. You may play your MLS next game and not realize that you're at uh, in Birmingham and the UAB coach or somebody else is there close by and they watch you play. Oh man, oh, hey, I saw you play on Saturday. Interesting. Oh, I never thought of that school. Okay, then you look them up and go, yeah, checks a lot of boxes. Maybe they add into the list. Okay, so it will be fluid. But I've, I've, I, unfortunately, I've been in those conversations where these are my top three schools. And guess what? Top three, didn't, they didn't want you. And now you're what? You're like, ooh, now I'm stuck. Okay? Those other things we talked about. Bullet point number three, this is big now. Again, this is, a, this is one of the things that the parents need to come in and make sure that you're helping out with. You need to make sure that your student athlete at the high school level is taking all the core courses, the proper core courses. If you get done your four years and you are missing one core course at the high school level, you are academically ineligible. It's going into your freshman year of college. So you have to get with those guidance people and make sure they're on track. Okay, 15 core courses, you gotta make sure that they're taking the right stuff. All right, some of the stuff that you think could be right, it's a half year type of class or whatever, could be very wrong in the eyes of the NCAA. Okay, so make sure, again, if your son or daughter wants to play soccer in college, that's huge. Make sure you get it right. Okay, just underneath of that, I still get this, still get this. And I know the standardized tests a lot of, in a lot of schools, they're not mandatory for admission, I get that. But I still have people saying, I didn't take the test. So, oh, it's spring, spring semester of my senior year. I didn't take a standardized test. Huh? What? Well, they're not mandatory. This is the main gauge for a lot of schools, how they ga gauge academic scholarship dollars through GPA and standardized test score. All right? So if you're missing the standardized test score, whether it's ACT or SAT, they may not be able to give you the proper amount of academic scholarships, which in Jim's world, Academic scholarships weigh far heavier than athletic scholarships in Jim's world. That's my two sons. 
They both had huge academic scholarships. Praise the baby Jesus, because they couldn't afford to go to those private schools without them, to the tune of $72,000, $68,000 a year. Whew, dude, you better do well on your standardized tests. So make sure you take a test. Okay? End of sophomore year, take a test. Okay? I'll tell you this. This is what I know. This is what I know from recruiting in the women's game. The girls, almost 100% across the board, test better on the ACT than the SAT. Why? I do not know. Maybe that's my doctoral thesis at some point, but I've seen test scores come across my desk in the, over the 12 years I did the women's game because there's a matrix that says, if you get this on the SAT or the ACT, you'll get this corresponding on the other side. More often than not, the ACT score was higher. I don't know why. You talk to a lot of the girls like, uh, the test just suits me better. I never took an SAT or ACT, I don't know. I don't know, but that's why I'm here. So, food for thought, food for thought. Recommend you take both, okay? Recommend you take both, but definitely get it done. Yeah, hi. Come on. Definitely get it done by your sophomore year. Don't be that, please don't be that person. Yeah, it's May of my senior year. I didn't take a test yet. Huh? Okay, next, make sure we create your player profile. Okay, I'll show you one, one or two of the ones that, that I'm putting together and we're trying to all get on the same page uh, to try to put together a Tormenta branded player profile. Thing looks awesome, okay? So we, we're trying to help you with your own personal one. In addition to us putting together a team player profile when we go to events, we hand all the college coaches there. Okay, that information on that's a little bit more limited, but it has picture, has all the players there. They can try, okay? But you gotta make sure you have your own individual one. We'll show you what that looks like. We'll help you put that together. Looks real nice when you send it out, okay? Reason why we're doing that, again, we're trying to in, sort of improve our brand awareness here at Tormenta. We're not a big club. We're not a big club, we're, we're tiny. I mean, you go to the Raleigh's of the world, the NCFC, somebody named Scott Gallagher, when they have 8,000 kids, we have 350. Yeah. So we're tiny. We're a tiny player in that space. So we got to get a little bit more bang for the buck. But when you look at these things, they look pretty sharp. But we need your help in get, getting that information so we can typeset this, put it all together for you. But that should come. That should come in these first two years. Okay. Uh, we're all doing this uh, VO recording of everything. I know. I mean, I've seen all their MLS Next games. Uh, on the platform because I'm, I'm sort of like at the main admin screen. So yeah, you got this. Now this is a player. It's a player job. Okay, talk about parents' job. Here's a player's job. Player's job is to get on your account, take a look at your highlights because you're all good in telephone world. All right, you can, you can figure. You got to go and you got to sort of cut down your highlight film from all the games that you've played in. Okay, so it should start in these first two years. Again, this will be fluid. This will be fluid. Because as you continue to play, get older, get more experience, yeah, your highlight film's gonna get a little bit nicer. All right, but you gotta get something for in these two years. Okay, junior year, it's gonna be the same thing. We'll have a junior year type clip, that'll be fluid. We'll have a senior year type of highlight, that'll be fluid. Okay, and then yeah, don't be afraid to start the process. I told you, Lila, ninth grader, ninth grader already emailed people. Yeah, you go, girl. I've already had a conversation with a college coach on her behalf as a ninth grader. Get going, get going. Okay, the landscape is very busy. A lot of people, domestic, international, we talked about that. You wait, you're gonna miss the bus. You're gonna miss the bus, okay? The bus is already packed. Make sense? Okay, second from the bottom, this is big again. This is one parent, a little bit more parent driven. Make sure you register, register for NCAA Eligibility Center. And AIA, it's gonna cost you a little bit of money. I apologize for that in advance, 75, 85 bucks, wherever it is. But if you wanna play NAIA, you have to do it. If you wanna play Division I or Division II NCAA, you have to do it. All right, that's how they check your, make sure all your academics are in order and make sure that you still have amateur status. But that's how on the back end, the compliance people at receiving school, they track your academic progress based on your eligibility number code, whatever it's called, right? Eligibility center code. That's how they track it on the back end. So I would get a spreadsheet. Doesn't so much say the person's name, but here's your eligibility number. And then we can track if you're taking your core courses correct. We can track if you're academically eligible based on your GPA and your standardized test score. Okay? Because the, those both, to be, both have to be at a minimum. All right, and then keep us updated, please. We can't help you unless you tell us where you are. Okay, those going into your junior year, again, these are things that we think you should be should be done at this point. Again, number one, grades stay up. Parents, make sure we are talking with school officials. Make sure the core courses are correct. 
Don't want that to be what makes someone academically ineligible. All right, you're, you're beginning to funnel that list down a little bit. Again, still be fluid. Somebody pop, may pop in, somebody may pop out based on some of the, the conversations you're having with college coaches now that they can reach out to you in the junior year. There's a fluid list, but it may start to whittle itself down a little bit. Okay, we talked about this previous, but hey, don't be afraid to go on some visits. At this point, they're all unofficial, meaning you pay for whatever you do on campus. Okay, but don't be afraid. Go there. If you have the chance to talk to admissions, schedule a tour through admissions. If you want to go do your own thing and just drive around, if it's in close proximity to one of the events that you're playing at, do that again. Right? Because I, I know it, it, this is what happens. I mean, anybody here have kids already went through the college process? Right? What happens is sometimes they get on the campus and what does your son or daughter do? Nah, nah, nah. And you're like, okay, we're out of here. Go to AAA. Okay. And what's happened sometimes, you drive in there and all of a sudden you see their eyes light up. Yeah, they see themselves there. All right? But if you never make the trip, that aha moment may never happen. Okay? So if you have the ability, yeah, take some visits. And I'm not saying you have to go to the ID camp or this or that. It may just be a drive-through, walk-through type of thing. All right? Have anybody been to Princeton's campus? You walk there, you're like, yeah, okay, I can do this. Yeah. All right. Have you been to LIU Brooklyn? I worked there for two years. You go there and you're like, just back the dumpster up. Anybody go to LIU? Hope not. Sorry, I didn't mean to offend anybody. I worked there for two years. You know, when they get the email and say the cafeteria is closed because of you fill in the blanks, you're like, <coughs> and you find out somebody left the back door open to the cafeteria, and you're not having cafeteria food for a couple weeks. You can imagine what was in the dining hall. So, okay, if you didn't like your standardized test, hopefully you prepared for and got a good score on the first round in your sophomore year. At the end of your, if you didn't, you take them again. <coughs> take them serious, but take them again. Okay? Player profile gets updated, right? We have all this stuff in commit. Again, you do your highlights. Make sure you get whatever you're getting this year. It should be better than what you had last year, so on and so forth. You continue to reach out to college coaches. Let us know what's going on. Okay? This is it. We're moving. Anything that I missed on there? Because we probably have 85 bullet points here. If we need no, um, one thing I will just touch on is just the point as it pertains to your highlight video. A lot of people put music and cool stuff on your highlight video. You might actually be hurting yourself because let's say, for example, I'm a goalkeeper and across my highlight video, it's just music of my favorite song. Well, if I'm a coach that's looking for intangible stuff, such as your ability to communicate, I may not hear you on your video because you have a really cool, updated song, but it's actually taken away some of the qualities that show you your biggest strength. If I'm a defender and my coach that wants to know, is this guy a communicator? Does he talk? Does he organize a defense? Does he organize in front of them? Just, just be really careful with all the additives to your video and you know, leave it as organic as possible because those things really do, when you're talking division one, you're talking things like that that become splitting hairs. Like this guy is quiet, so he's not my cup of tea, but this guy is an organizer. But you know, limit the bells and whistles in your highlight video to just you know, showcasing you as a total package. And, and things like communication do matter, right? Yeah. To that point, and again, these are, these are all true stories. I can't make this stuff up, okay? I have been on the receiving end of highlight videos that have way inappropriate lyrics on them, right? Put, put the music on. And the lyrics are like, whoa. You know what I'm talking about. I don't say anything else. You know where that one goes. In the delete pile, okay? So to Stefan's point, don't do it. 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 Okay, and with that, again, that's another thing. You know, we'll help you work through the player profile. We want to make sure it's a tormented branded. We want to make sure it reads a certain way, has a certain layout, so on and so forth. We, we want that consistency from the club side so the receiving coach starts to realize the tormented player. Okay, step above, step above, right? Little club, step above. Okay, same thing with the video. Okay, make sure you send us what, you're, look, what, what it looks like so we can proof it. Right, because there's certain rights and certain wrongs in there as well. All right, and you have because you know I'm terrible at technology. We learned that right at the start, right? Yeah. Yeah. Terrible at technology, but you got to learn to put that little circle around you before the clip runs, or the little arrow before the clip runs. All right, you have to learn how to do that. I can't do that. Okay, but you got to learn how to do that. That's got to be in there. Okay, and a lot of times 
you know, a lot of the D1 coaches, they're okay with, I'm okay with, this is, you put in there, service from wide areas. Shots from outside 18. 1v1 defending. See what I'm saying? Goalkeepers, yeah. Dealing with wide service. Shot stopping from the middle. Distribution with hands. All right, instead of the clips being all over the place, where one's a save, one's a punt, one's a drop kick, one's a catching of a cross. Right. Now they have a certain pattern to them that is easy, easy for the college coach to understand, even if you have that little, all right? I saw someone, a video this week, had a little intro. Person's picture, some of the stuff that you would see on the player profile. Magic, magic, love it, love it, okay? So yeah, it's gonna take a little bit of, of editing and stuff to it, but again, it's a crowded landscape, a lot of people. A lot of different countries want to come to the U.S. and play soccer because there's good money in there and they want to live here, right? So you got to do your thing. Can't be poor quality. Okay? Anything, anything on that one? No, no just categorize your videos. I think you double in on Jim. So important. Find a central midfielder. Show yourself breaking a play, playing forward, breaking lines, all these things. Categorizing your video is going to be really important. If I'm a center back, playing out from the back, putting your headers, um, organization, all those things, categorizing the video makes such a difference. Some of the boys from last year's team who I had with the 17s had clips here, there, and everywhere. I was unsure if they went out from the back, if they're a winger, they're running in behind. You weren't sure what order the clips were in, so just make it easier. Um, and it only adds an extra, extra little bit of time once you're editing, but just make sure it's categorized um, and it makes it much easier for a coach to, to cipher through that video. Yeah, and like I said, run it by us. Send it to us first before you attach it to your player profile. All right, you're in your senior year. Any seniors here? Any seniors here? You said you're senior. Not me, my daughter. Okay. She's not with me. She's working. Love that. Love that. Take that picture for everyone. Okay? So, again, handful of bullet items for your senior year. Here's some of the most important. Again, grades. Grades, finish strong. I heard people, hey, the senior slide. Taking the senior slide, right? Second semester, I'm just not gonna go to class anymore. My GPS, I've heard people, money, senior slide. Guess what happens to the scholarship money? See ya, gone, gone. I can't make these stories up, okay? So, gotta finish strong, okay? Don't do the senior slide. Starting to narrow the list. If you haven't committed to this point, verbally committed, you're still working on getting that list down, okay? You may be in that process. Hey, if you need to take SAT, ACT again, get it done first fall semester. Don't wait till the spring. Again, parents can do FAFSA in the fall now. Okay, admissions, most of their admissions dates are, whether you're early decision one, two, regular, rolling, a lot of that stuff you'll start to see is happening in November, December. So try to take those tests as early as you can so you can get the best possible scores, get the most possible academic scholarship money. All right, if you're still, if you haven't committed, you're still talking to coaches. Again, this is probably a little bit closer to where we're involved now as Tormenta staff. You know, getting some of those character calls and so on and so forth. They're deciding on two or three or four players. If you send them a video with bad words in it, guess what? You're off that list, right? If you're posting stuff on your social media account with red cups and vaping pens, and you're to see ya, see ya, bye. You okay? Do you we have, have a slide bye? on social media? What's that? Do we have a slide on social media? Do not, we should. That's a whole other chat about social media after this because I'm very passionate about that. Yeah, so if you can't do anything unintelligent on social media, I know for a fact college coaches will look there and they have taken money from people because he said something wrong. I mean, I'm talking to a guy who, he was working with a player at University of South Florida two years ago. She got drafted, NWSL, something came out right away. Or she got drafted, boom. Said something inappropriate five years ago, put it on social media. You know, something racially based, blah, blah. Guess what, NWSL, playing overseas now. That's from five years ago. What's that, what grades I put her in? Eighth? All right, this stuff is real. It is real, okay? All right, you know, um, the whole college ID camp, that's a whole separate conversation. Like I said, that could be an hour-long presentation there. You may be going to a college ID camp just to solidify some things on your end, maybe solidify some things on the college coach end, but similar to the other things, highlight video, player profile. My recommendation, I do this for all the girls, is contact me first regarding ID camps before you go and spend all your money, okay? I'm sure both these guys can tell you this because this is a fact. I know this is a fact because I did it myself. A lot of times college ID camp is what? It is a business. It is a part of an assistant coach's salary to get people to come to the ID camp 
so that they make more because their stipend sometimes is not so good. So the head coach would be like, hey, you run the ID camp, I'll give you 40% of net proceeds. So what's the assistant coach gonna do? Come to my camp, come to my camp, come to my camp, come to my camp. But they have no interest in you as a soccer player, but what do they have interest in? Your money, okay? So I always tell people, be very careful here. This is a case by case basis. Parents, if you're that inclined that you wanna send your son or daughter to 92 ID camps, hey, go for it, go for it. I guarantee 91 and a half percent of those, or 91 and a half of those, coach has no interest in your son or daughter, but you just spent your money, okay? And I, you know I've done that, I've done that. Made that mistake, learn from my mistakes, please. Okay, but talk to your coaches first. Make sure it makes sense. Make sure it makes sense. Okay, the last thing we wanna do is see you as a family spend your money in areas that you don't need to spend it Right? Like I said, we talked with everybody know Elise Holsey from our U19s from last year, right? She got stuck in the COVID recruiting bubble in there, got caught, right? We'll talk about that in a little bit. Didn't have a place to go. This is April of her senior year, not committed. Good friend of mine of 25 years, gets a head coaching job at Campbell. Hey Jeff, how you doing? Saw him in March at Jefferson Cup. He sat next to us during your game on field one. All right, we talked for a while. Hey Jeff, I got this kid, look for a striker. 2022 class. Yeah, I am actually. I don't know if I have any money. Okay, Jeff, that's great. Let's talk. We talk. Get back. Jim, oh, she's got to come to my ID camp. Jeff, the kid can play. I'm telling Jeff, we've known her 25 years. Guess what? At least didn't go to the ID camp. At least got money to play. Athletics grant and aid. Played a couple minutes at Clemson the other day. She said she was in the starting lineup for the friendly two games ago, but it got rained out. That's a freshman. So again, you don't need to go to the ID camp. Don't need to go. Necessarily. Okay, case by case basis on that, okay? Talking about, if you're still at that point where you haven't made your final decision, you may be asking for an official visit, unofficial visit, understand the difference again, unofficial, you go there, you take the tour, you may stay overnight, but everything's on your dime as a family. Official visit, the old school ways, and I know the official visit sort of is a, a dead dinosaur these days, official visit, 48 hours on the campus, the school pays for everything, a lot of times you stay in the dorms uh, with the athletes on the team, drop them off on a Friday, pick them up on Sunday, you do everything, see everything, sometimes go to a football game, whatever, they roll out the red carpet, okay? I know in the women's space, a lot of times the official visit, because of the recruiting cycle, in the women's space, the official visit is basically that time to get all the commits together at one point, and then that's when they take their nice picture, here's all our, our commits for the 2023 class, they get them at the football game, they all take their picture, but that's, that's it's already done. All right, the commitment's already done. They just bring them in to do the 48-hour overnight. Then take their picture and say, this is our class, okay? If you are, and this is for all, uh, I'm sorry, junior and senior year, okay? Anytime you get response from a college coach, make sure you respond back to him or her. 48-hour rule, okay? They email you on a Monday. Please get back to them by Wednesday, okay? Their time is valuable. Like Jordan said, I got 200 emails a day at LIU, and we were not, remember, dump truck or dumpster, okay? <laughs> Not the best place to be, but respond back to these people, okay? Stefan. I, I just couldn't help but tell you the importance of this, and I can tell you firsthand of what happens. You know, a lot of our players that play in MLS, and I can only speak on that division, you know, because they think that they're at the pinnacle of boys' soccer, and sometimes some of these schools that reach out to them, they think, you know, to use these words, they think that they're beneath them. So what happens is they, they put all their eggs in that Clemson's gonna call them or North Carolina or Wake is gonna call them. And what happens is when that doesn't materialize, then they now want to come back to all these coaches that were reaching out to them previously. But the fact of the matter is, is that those guys are moved on from you because of one simple thing. You didn't say, hey, Thank you, coach, for considering me. You know, you are one of my selections. I'm currently trying to narrow down my choices, but I will keep you informed. That's all that those quote unquote non brand name schools are asking for. Just an acknowledgement of their email. Because I can tell you, when, when those dream schools that we want you to put on your list do not come knocking, those people are also not waiting. And so just make sure even if it's a school that you have never heard of, just be courteous and just shoot them back a response. Hey coach, thank you so much. You know, I'm really, you know, flattered that you 
thought of me for your program, please allow me a few weeks to decide and I will inform you of whatever. Even if you don't have plans to go in there, but it shows a certain level of respect. And if something falls through, it's something that you might still have as an opportunity for you in the end. And, and to that point, right again, fact, I can't make this stuff up. The college coach network is very tight. It's very tight, okay? So even if I'm at school X, Stefan's at school Y, Jordan's at school Z, all of a sudden I'm reaching out to Maddie, I've emailed her a couple times, she hasn't gotten back to me, okay? Because I'm that beneath, beneath Maddie, okay? But she's interested in Stefan or Jordan's school, all right? And they're good friends of mine, be like, this kid never even got back to me, right? I, Again, it speaks to character, it speaks to character a little bit. So I could turn around and talk to my friends and be like, you know, this girl gave me the cold shoulder, okay. Then they may look twice and be like, yeah, I don't know if that's something I want in my program, because I want someone with right, better character, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so they said, respond back to these people. If it's a no, it's a no, all right? But do that. Say, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not interested in your school, I'm looking at other options. Just tell them that, it takes one sentence. All right, 30 seconds of your time, okay? But if they do reach out, reach back out. Men, again, crowded landscape, crowded landscape. They're getting 200 emails, all right? So if they don't hear from you, they're gonna assume you're not interested either, so see ya, they're gonna move on to the next person. All right, they got 26 people in line for your position. They got plenty of options, trust me, at all levels, at all levels, okay? Last couple things, again, we'll help you with the profile, make sure it's up to date, blah, blah, blah. The highlight film, that kind of thing. Parent, here's parent job again, FAFSA, okay? FAFSA can be done in the fall now, as opposed to where it was in the spring after admission. So do it in the fall, get it done, all right? As much as they say, it's super easy, guess what? My wife is so much smarter than I am, guess who did it for our two sons? She did, so I was like, oh my God, a lot of stuff. And I know they, oh yeah, it self-populates you know, from your tax forms, it's, it was always incorrect for us. Never, never worked out right, never worked out right. You had the same experience, Leo? Yeah. So, but yeah, parents, I'd get on the fast in the fall, do it, okay? Because it can be a little bit tricky, can be a little bit messy, don't let that hang around. Okay, the other thing I always recommend is this, because I've seen people try to double back on this, always click that your son or daughter is interested in work study. Always click that they are. Okay, whether they take it or not is immaterial, okay? But work study is basically an opportunity for them to have an on-campus job. They get a little extra spending money. They say offsets tuition, that never does that. They put it in their pocket, they're buying pizza and whatever. Fine, works out great, we did it for our kids. But here's the problem, if you don't click on it during the FAFSA process, and then you go back later, oh yeah, my son or daughter, they want work study, it's too late. It's too late, because the schools only have so many allotments of work study, either so many jobs or so many things that they can get from the federal government. So if they're gone, they're gone. Okay, so you gotta do it on the front end. Don't try to double back on the back end. Be like, oh yeah, now my son wants it. Like, nope, it's August, my son wants it. No, nope. too late, okay? You can always choose to deny it. But make sure you elect work study when you do the FAFSA, okay? Last couple things, make sure your clearinghouse stuff is up to date. For those who go NCAA one or two, you will have to do final amateurism, which is just basically clicking a couple boxes in your eligibility center uh, profile thing. That happens in May, okay? And then, yeah, just say if you haven't made your commitment at this point, hopefully we're there. Get it in, get it done, okay? Any questions about this? Again, yeah, there's probably another 80 bullet points. Those are the most important, okay? Yeah, here's some of, the, some of the ways that we help. Hopefully tonight was a good start, okay? Please know, call me anytime. Call me anytime, email me anytime, right? Sometimes I'm a little slow. I know I have some people that I'm a little slow getting back to, okay? But I'll get back to you. But again, talk with us about best fit. Best fit, and that could be a range, okay? I said, Jim, Jim is not in the business of saying, Gianna, don't think about Clemson. Don't think about Princeton. Do that, no. I don't, who makes that decision? The college coach is gonna make that decision. Okay, keep your options open, dream big, never know what's gonna happen, but we're gonna talk about some things. Hey, you need to work on this and this if you wanna play at Princeton. Okay, great, but okay. I'm not gonna tell you, I've run six so of my colleagues. Yeah, if you're not going to South Carolina, what's wrong with you? Okay, she goes to South Carolina, hates it, and then what happens? Transfers, and then all of a sudden, what happens to her credits? They stay in South Carolina, she transfers somewhere else. Now, it's, now I gotta go to school for another, half a semester or half a year, full year. That's more money out of mom and dad's pocket because now I'm on a five-year plan because I transferred, okay? So don't choose a school for me, choose a school for you, okay? Again, we'll help you with the player profile, I'll show you what that looks like, okay? Again, these are big, send these to us, send these to us. I have no problem proofreading your email, 
Okay, what am I looking for? Spelling, punctuation, capitalization, hopefully limited slang. I'm learning words in the last three months that I didn't know were words that everybody's using these days, but that's okay. Okay, well, we'll, hey, we'll help proofread your emails. I'll show you an example of someone's in a second. Okay, we'll give you advice on the highlights, same thing like that. And, and don't be afraid. I tell all the girls, send me your list. Send me your list so that I know who you're interested in because there's a good chance in my world that I know that coach. And I can have that conversation with that coach on the back end, that character end, or I run across him, at, ran into Jeff at Jefferson Cup. Hey, Jeff, you need a 2022 20 striker. I got somebody. Really? Yeah, I need that. Right? These things happen. These things happen. This is real. Okay? But we can do those things for you. Okay? Anything you guys on that? So, again, specific to this, when, when we're on the field coaching you, we always talk about attention to details, right? Body shape, you know, it's the same thing when I was a college coach that the details become important. And I'll give you a classic story. If we got an email from a potential player who did small things such as not capitalize letters and the letter I, you know what assumption we've made about that person already? They're lazy. So to Jim's point, that email goes straight into garbage. Because if you don't have the time to make an impression on us and just proofread something as what you're writing to us, we've already made the assumption that you're probably gonna come to our program and not be the attention to detail athlete that we're looking for. And it's literally as simple as that because the quantity of people that literally reach out to us, we don't mind just, you know, throwing that one person's email in the in the dumpster bin because we still have 500 more that probably we're gonna find somebody we want. And it's literally something as simple as that. Not taking the time to make it sound right. And that just is the difference between us us continuing to read about you or just saying, oh my God, they don't, they didn't even check this garbage on to the next. Right, it's a crowded landscape. Jim. You're trying to get on somebody's team, you want their scholarship money? It's exactly right. Just going off on the last one, I think is arguably one of the most important things is your relationship with your current um, club coach. Mm -hmm. I know I, I'm not speaking for you, Jim, but no, USLW, USL2, USL1, with the amount of recruiting that we have to do from college, I now have relationships and connections with colleges that I didn't have two years ago when I moved to the area, okay? Played in North Carolina, was an assistant in the Midwest in Kansas, came down to Georgia. Um, I now have relationships because of the recruiting that we do for the whole club. We have relationships with so many different college coaches now where I've got, the, there's a school specifically in this area who will call me consistently and just be like, do you have any kids for us from the academy? It's a South Carolina school. Your relationship with your club coach is incredibly important, okay? So when your club coach asks you, the college coach is going to ask your club coach, what are the training habits? Well, the timeliness, can you trust them to be on time for things? Um, are they respectful, are they coachable? So the little details in, in sessions were, the reality is our job is to prepare you for the next level. We, 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 many people do in this room know what it's like at the next level and the details that go into it. So if you can't respond to the way we wanna do things, college is amplified by 100. Right, it's a three-month season where you get to compete, and all the details matter. So, when it comes to your relationship with your club coach, the big thing that they're going to rely on um, the college coaches is speaking to Jim, speaking to the Tom and to staff, and it's going to be more so. Yeah, we've got an idea of a player, but timeliness, training habits are the biggest one. Okay, what intensity are you training at? Do you just turn up and when you fancy it one session a week? When he fancies it, good, he or she is a good player, but they take two or three days off. It can't it? It just can't happen, right? So it's it's our job to continually have an environment that pushes that um, and then hopefully educate the players along the way as this is a, a stepping stone to the, to, that leads into the collegiate environment. So that relationship between you and your club coach is important because Jim's relationship with the Princeton coach or the Harvard coach is also incredibly important. So if you're not doing things right, it's hard for us to put our name on somebody who we can't trust to say Brad's the head coach at Clemson. And he asks about Stefan, I'm like, no, this isn't you, but I'm saying like, no, 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 no. I'm sure, not sure about sure. his training habits. He's a good kid, but he's, he's a little bit lazy. He doesn't keep up his school grades. I have to be, we, it's our job as coaches to give that honest 
um, feedback and assessment to those college coaches because ultimately our reputations and our names are also put onto you guys. So it's incredibly important that you have a really good relationship with your club coach, especially when it comes to comes to your your character and how you carry yourself. So, and we we won't jeopardize that trust with somebody because if you sell them a false bill of goods about a potential player and that player shows up on campus, even though we know that that person was going to be that person, they will never take another Tormenta player or our word again because it just might seem to them that, oh, we just wanted to push them off to their campus. So we will not lie. You know, I, 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 tell, I tell my players this all the time, you need to make sure that you truly want me as a reference. Because I will not lie to somebody to jeopardize their opinion of how I evaluate a player. Because if I, if I trick them into taking somebody, they will never come back for another torment of player unless it's the advice of somebody else. So that's very powerful for the athletes in here. You might assume, oh, he's my coach. I'm gonna just, he's just gonna speak glowingly about me. If that's not who you are as a player, you might be a good player and you help us win games, but we're not gonna be ever deceitful to the person that really wants to know about you because then that's our death in the respectable community. Everybody understand those points? And that is huge. And I kid you not, again, I care about telling true stories. Had a conversation with the college coach about three of our players. Three of our players. She took two. Didn't take the third. That's nothing negative about the third player. But again, it was about me being honest with her. Here's what I'm looking for, Jim. What can you tell me? Here's what you get. Okay, I'm not sure if that player's ready for your, your team, your level. Great. That's where the conversation went. Okay? So she moved on. Player moved on. Now I'm trying to help her find that next fit. Okay, but that is very much real. Very much real, okay? Going back to Jordan's point too, again, I know these guys, they, they're well connected in the college game, I'm well connected in the college game. Please cross-reference with the staff. Cross-reference, don't feel like, because they coach on the boys' side, I can only ask them about men's programs. Jim coaches on the girls' side, only ask Jim about the women's programs. I know a ton of men's coaches. I'm sure these guys know a ton of women's coaches through all their interactions and work at all the different levels. It is your benefit to ask them, right? Share your list with them. Hey, I'm interested in so-and-so, so-and-so. Do you know them? Do you know those coaches? They may, they may. And get back to Stefan's point, there's your reference. When it comes time for that call, Stefan, yeah, he coached at Western Illinois. So he knows the coaches there. If you're interested in that school, that's your guy, right? I, right? Talking about some of these Ivy League things, right? Yeah, if you're interested in Penn and Princeton, I got Jim Barlow on speed dial. I coach Brian when he was at Ryder and goalkeeper. Yeah, let me know. Let me know. All right, I can help you. All right, I got a ton of men's coach contacts. Okay, any questions about that? Anything? <clears throat> All right, here you go. Somebody shared this with me. Oh, this is what Tom put together. Yeah, so Tom put this together for everybody. Again, hopefully you can see this. I tried to squeeze it onto one slide. You have to step up because the print's a little small. Here's an idea of what your Introductory email could look like. All right, in the top it just says coach's name underneath my little uh, connected to TV Samsung. Okay, so this is what your first email could look like. Dear Coach Smith, blah, 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 blah. All right, here's what I like about this it references the coach's name in the intro. Okay, don't just blast out. I've seen this, I've seen this. All right, and I'm not very good at technology, but when I look at, when I hit reply all and I see that prospective student athlete sent this to me and 600 other coaches in the reply all where's that where's that email go delete goes delete all right because there's no if he puts coach or she puts coach and they have 600 people in there they're just fishing fishing for anybody to respond okay so you have to personalize it you go back to your spreadsheet you had your list school coach first name last name email address so you have to do each one individually have to sorry a little bit of work involved all right, dear Coach Radwanski, congratulations on a fantastic 2023. I've been following the Clemson Tigers for the last two years. I played for Tormenta. All right, you start to plug. It doesn't have to be like this specific. But here's my upcoming schedule for CISA tournament. Um, 45 minutes away from your camp. I'd like to come visit. Okay, 
My coach is Jim. He was born in New Jersey too. I know you were. You're down the shore. He's central Jersey. All right, but you put all that stuff in there. Send it out. Next coach, correct what you need to correct, okay? Doesn't have to be a whole new email in this, that sense, but you gotta change the coach name, you gotta change the school name, you gotta change the mascot, you may have to change the major if you're referencing, okay? But you gotta send all these out individually. You send them, send them out in bulk, and BCC every, going in the delete bin. Going, crowded landscape, my friends, crowded landscape, okay? But that's a good way to have your first one in there. With that, I would say, here's a copy of my player profile. Okay, we have that, put that in there. Within that player profile, should, should have your highlights. You're home free on your first email. Home free, okay? They get back to you with, you know, it's before the June 15th date of going into your junior year. I can't talk to you right now. Come to our ID camp. Okay, that's when you get back to us. Here's what I got back from school X, from coach Y. What do you think? And then we'll help you, okay? Anyway, I think that's too long or too short. Goldilocks, yeah, Goldilocks. Oh, yeah, it's perfect because remember, we talk about the amount of emails college coaches get, and they don't want to read an absolute page. You know, this first, uh, this first paragraph, just a little congrats on the second. The second statement, it tells you who you are, position, and what your strengths are. That part right there, what are some of your accolades? Four sentence that you would be academically eligible for our university and you would qualify as a student first. Tell us some information about your next game and who should I contact for bang, done. There's people that send paragraphs. They don't read it. They just literally don't. Okay, so can you, so after we reach out to this so college coaches, right? And then that, tends to get you on a list, right? So then you start getting, you know, notifications and invites for Zoom calls or webinars or whatever from the admissions. Um, well, how important is it to, do they go hand in hand? Like if you ignore, you know, a, a, basically a blanket blast email from an admission inviting to, you know, some virtual campus tour or something. Um, if you ignore that, but you've been engaging with your coach, my, my, from my personal experience, I'd say the two are not that tightly connected. Mm -hmm. Remember the old days? The old days we used to, you know, when you took the SAT, you signed up, and all of a sudden you got how many things in the mail that you got? Right. You got the prospectus in the mail? <laughs> we're, we're in that day and age now where you're going to get that. I wouldn't look too far into it right? because you know, at the end of the day, what's the coach's job? The coach's job is to fill, fill the roster on their team, so on and so forth, but they're also trying to get the people in the school enrollment, enrollment pays the bills, blah, blah, blah. So that's why that information is getting passed along, but yeah, they're not they're not that tightly uh, connected. So I wouldn't I don't fear that I didn't get on the admission Zoom and they're gonna find out and they're gonna think I'm not interested. I wouldn't stress out stress about that. No, I was gonna say I think the most important piece is the communication with the coach. So as long as that's going well and you're in this back and forth communication, the admissions tools, the connecting with admissions, that will all come through the coach. Um, but this this couple of my U17s used this last year. Um, and it proved to be a very efficient letter. A couple of guys went on an official visit, basically from the day upon kickoff time, having that game location um, and inviting schools out to come and watch. One school came and watched, <coughs> two guys went on an official visit, one was a school in Florida. Um, he's now a rising senior on Stefan's 19, so really important. I think for me, I'll, I'll speak for, this is just from my group last year, and this will be going out to the 17s this year. We're going to Atlanta to play SSA, we, we need to be emailing schools in and around Atlanta at all levels. If we're going down to where else we go? Birmingham, Alabama, okay, we went there with the USL Academy team. We went and told two campuses, we told UAB Division One. we drove an hour to tell AUM, uh, down in Auburn, Montgomery, okay, really eye-opening for those guys. So when we go and play in different areas, really important just to include this in the email, and then you've also got um, your highlight tape on the video, and if the coach doesn't make it to watch in person, you have as they all touched on, now we should all have links to full games. Um, and as a coach, sometimes if the, if the communication is um, going well, they will ask for full game footage, so it's important that you have those. So. You're not just going to come because Tormenta's down there. You know, no, honestly, we don't have that cachet that naturally is going to gravitate people to just come and watch us. Now, occasionally you might go to a showcase 
where your team is slated against a natural powerhouse that just usually, because of the team that you're playing, has a certain attraction and you benefit from having to play that level, but this brings the people to you, right? They're not on Tormenta's website, then I can't wait to go watch this group. So it's very important that you get this information out to them as well. And, and we said before, the, the other thing that we're doing is we're doing those team profiles, right? So I know specifically for the women, anytime that we, Star, that we go to a college showcase, I'm blasting that out. I think my distribution list is about 550 schools. So I'll send out the profiles for all the older teams, the college age eligible recruiting teams. I'll send it all out to those schools. And that'll help to also drive some interest in getting coaches to games. Okay? What's your ace in the hole? Before we go on the next slide, your ace in the hole is the Tormenta brand awareness is going through the roof right now. Going through the roof. What did our USL1 team do back in the spring? Anybody remember? U.S. Open Cup, win, win, couple wins there, right? Doing all that kind of stuff. USL two team has been super strong since it started in existence. Okay, USL women's team, national champs this year. So people know the Tormenta name now. So even though we may not be the biggest club in the U.S., brand awareness is in your favor. Again, that's why we're we're asking for a certain level of professionalism in everything that you guys do. We're trying to give you a certain level of professionalism on the things that we're able to help you with. Because when you send something out and it has our logo, that speaks a lot now. They know what's going on down here. Okay? Questions from anybody? Anything we missed? Question there, Nicole. Certainly. You, you ask because I'm trying to get to one of these profiles. Yeah, so um, about the portal that's opened up over like the last couple of years, is that opened up to soccer players? Is that still just like a kind of like a football thing? Transfer portal, NCAA, anybody. 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 They're going to tighten that up. They said they're going to tighten that up to transfer windows. So just everybody understand the question. The whole trick, if you're familiar with what's going on, transfer portal, a lot of, and we touched upon this, upon this real quick, that a lot of what's going on is because of the COVID year, you know, that the NCAA turned around and they granted everybody a fifth year of athletic eligibility so so what they did is um, you know that sort of messed with the whole recruiting process now these kids get that extra year so they get extra year eligibility they get an extra year of, of athletic scholarship opportunity so you had a lot of these kids who they would go and they would if use up their four years of eligibility and get their undergraduate degree at school X and then if school X did not have a master's program they can go play another year at a different school take a master's program and get that fifth year. So you have a lot of that going on. You have some kids that, you know, this wasn't the right fit for me, and then they just turn around and transfer either freshman, sophomore, junior, going into senior year. Um, but it was a free for all, and now they're trying, the NCAA's trying to reel that in. I heard conversation happening, I guess it was a day or two ago, uh, that they're gonna try to create little windows in there, that it could be like a four week window to enter and for coaches to extract players out of the transfer portal, one happening in the fall, one happening in the spring, as opposed to being 10, 11, 12 months long. Okay. And it's, a, it's a huge number, though, of people in it. I mean, for women's soccer, it was it's over 700 people in the transfer portal. Yeah. Again, this is the space that we're all in in our sport. So understand, and I apologize, I did not create the pandemic, okay? But here's, what, here's the problem that it's had, is because everybody's getting that fifth year, a lot of the college coaches, especially on the women's side, and for the men's side, from what I've seen, has been very similar that coaches are dipping into the transfer portal to take a fifth year player who has four years of college experience, who is 22, 23 years old. They will recruit that player first before they recruit the 18 year old, 17 year old with zero college experience. Okay, that's what's going on in the landscape. Again, all these things we've talked about before crowded, domestic, international, tons of kids, a little bit of program, not a lot of money. But now all of a sudden you add a fifth year and all that for what happened to a pandemic, it's a mess, it's a mess. So if you're a junior or senior here, you're gonna be fighting that a little bit, all right? They said it's gonna take five years to flush it through to get back to a normal recruiting cycle, a normal scenario, makes sense, because the fifth year grants, okay? If you're a sophomore, freshman, time is on your side, but it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy, that is the fact. All right, and I'll tell you this, Jim, USLW team, what was our pro player profile this year? 21, 22, 23 year olds. That's what I look for. On the women's team, I looked at kids from Pacific. People were like, where's Pacific? Have you ever heard of it? University of Pacific, never heard of it. Guess what? Yeah, Abby Wolf, 
72 starts. We'll take you on our women's team. Cameron Scully, 69 starts. We'll take you on our women's team. All right, that's what the college coaches are doing too. I can get a transfer from Duke. We played four years. Perennial top five program. I'll take that over an 18-year-old from somewhere that I know nothing about. That's the landscape. Okay? Okay, just quick, give you this real fast. Gives you an idea of what, what we're trying to do. Okay? I modified this a little bit for this year's players. I took a logo, made the logo bigger, and squeezed, squeezed over where the number 21 is. Okay, but you just sort of see what the, what the layout is. Okay, we're using some stuff out of Canva, so it's not that hard. But again, it gives you the information that I would expect to see as a college coach. Birthday, graduation year, player name, number, things like that. Okay, it gives a little bit of the academic history. All right. Again, Elise was one of those ones that takes standardized test until her team. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we have no information there. All right, but again, honors classes, AP classes. You know, I tell people if you take an AP class and you took the test and got a three, four, or five, I would put that information on there. That's the kind of stuff that speaks to college coaches, to Stefan's point. I gotta make sure that you can make it through four years of school. So if you're getting threes, fours, and fives, you're, I got a five on the physics AP test. Oh, all over that player. Yeah. Where do we get you in? Okay, but you know, some of the other social contacts over there, some of the other experience that Elise has. Okay, like I said, you've got the section for highlights. We would put your highlight link in there. So once you do that, we ask everybody to, again, this is player stuff because I can't do this. Do your highlights, figure out how to do it to YouTube, which gives you a link. Now I can drop that link right in there where highlights is. And when we send this out to college coaches, boop, to click on that, they're good to go. Okay, again, fluid piece, I have a copy of this. So if something changes in between freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year, hey, I made National Honor Society, boom, I can plug it right in, okay? But again, that's sort of the branding that, I said, the one that we have this year is a little bit nicer at the top, and like I said, the logo is a lot bigger hanging out on the right, but that's what we put together for all our players, okay? Questions about that? And that's the thing that you can email to college coaches. Yes, sir, Mr. Robert? Where did you go to do that? Is that on the permanent website? <laughs> No. What's going to happen is this. We just sent you that information. I sent that email out today that said, if you're, you know, fill out that questionnaire. So what we're doing with that, Brad and I, is we're on the women's side, we're gathering that information to figure out who may be interested in playing college soccer. The next email after that is going to be, once we have that list, here's the stuff that you guys send me. So, okay, Abby, those guys are going to be, I need, all right, and it'll be name, address, cell phone number, email, all right, um, you know, what year are you in school, what school are you in? Give me all your club experience. I'm gonna need all this. I'll typeset it because it gets a little, gets a little, and goes all over the place. All right. So again, we're trying to create something professional on our end that is consistent, that is branded, so that we send it out. It looks good. Looks. Like I, said, I sent this to somebody else in the spring, and it was all messed up. Okay. So we'll get that information to you. We'll do it. We'll send it back. You proof my work because my eyes are getting old, and then we'll fix it and we'll get it ready to go. Okay. But again, this goes out with that email from the previous page. Initial email, comes off of that list, ready to go. If you're beyond that, I would definitely get with the coaches. Again, you know, we talked as a staff the other day coming into this meeting that everybody's case is individual, okay? So if you've already started and you're having conversations or whatever, you gotta get with us, okay? Let us help you to the best of our ability so that it's going right, it's getting done, you're not spending your money in areas that you don't need to spend your money in, Okay, all you people that are spending money on the NCSA or the N, whatever it is, I don't know what it's called. NCSA. Yeah, NCSA, shame on you, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that, okay? We can do all this. This is even better than what they do. And guess what? This doesn't cost you anything. From what I understand, that costs you a lot of money. Questions? Please, don't have this be about us. As far as highlight videos, um, I don't see a lot of parents filming on the sideline. Our VO videos, are they good enough, or should, should a parent be investing in a device? No, I mean, our stuff, the yeah. Best way to do it? Yeah, our stuff should be fine because it gives you that sort of above field perspective there. So that's, that's the best way. Is, is, uh, you guys help me out on this. But, yeah, take a handful of games and just figure out what you like and pull it all together. And because of the angle of VO, you can usually get most of the field on the, on the video. So then also, in turn, it's off the, field, off the ball habits and things like that. VO is perfect. So once each coach for their age group, so for the 17s, we have the resources section on player metrics. I'll put the links to, we'll have a game folder. We'll have all the links to the games in there. You guys go on there, click it, screen record. I 
the way I make videos for USL1 when I do analysis is screen record, put it in an iMovie, and I can edit from there. However you want to edit it, which is easiest for you, um, use whatever program, but the VO is more than, more than adequate. Yeah. For Four, five, six minutes. Just said, let us see it, just make sure it has that sort of segmented, like George was talking about before. But yes. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So, oops, sorry. You said this in Austin, right? You go. Um, the viewers are in the South of the women, but Ski and John are in the South. Our, our boys' teams are getting these two. We're having a, our boys will have this as well. So, for the first time this year, we've created some. We, we had our team one, and now for our both men and women's side, we have a Tormenta um, thing for men and women. The, the only, the, to be honest, the only difference currently is that on the boy side, until we continue to grow our women as we have, you know, we just have to have a, a lot more onus on our players because we just have double the amount of girls. So we, we as coaches wouldn't be able to do this for every single person. But we're gonna, we're gonna try to do it in a way that the form is able to be self-fulfilled. So is this something that's gonna be coming out this month, next month? This is, uh, we, we have a few milestones in our own academy in for the month of September where, you know, we want the profiles. For example, we have a milestone calendar this year where, you know, we haven't talked about it with you guys because we're just getting past regular registration, but by September 15th, we want your individual player profile complete, check mark. And then any person that hasn't done it, we know to follow up, hey, we sent this out two days ago, you haven't done it, you're way behind. Oh, it's October 1st, we've now played five games. Have you clipped your best two minutes? Just to keep the kid on track and saying, you should have done this by now. And so that will start for us as we move into September. Yeah, and the other side, but I don't know if, if your players are in the MLS Next space or not, but the MLS Next inherently has more eyes on it than any other program that we have here, any other program in the country, um, just by the nature of what it is. So like I said, we need to do more on the girl side because we're not in that space like they are. I said that, you're talking top of the pyramid on the youth side, on the boys, so there's, I mean, yeah, I know they have all those internal profiles all these college coaches get. So they said, you'll, you'll have people show up to a league game ML, M, in MLS Next. That's not going to happen on the girls' side. So like I said, we're, we're trying to play catch up a little bit to that group that's already – I mean, they got a huge head start on us. So we're trying to close the ground a every, little bit. Every so. college coach has access to any video that we upload, which is mandatory for all our games. So literally, if they wanted to go watch a Tormenta game – they can just literally log into the same website that we log into with a coach access and click on any game across the country and watch the entire thing. Right, but it's still that doesn't negate having to do these things. 100%. Yeah, so, so you still got to do that because it's a big crowded space that we're talking about. So. You have a question, my friend? Um, so for like the highlights, is it okay to include high school highlights too, or is it better to just stick with your club? No, yeah, I think you, you could do, the question was, can you put high school highlights in there? I think you can do both right now. Yeah, anybody that's doing ODP kind of stuff, same kind of thing, right? Yeah, there's, so, also, uh, there's also, sorry to cut it, you, no, uh, let's say for argument's sake, you're a defender, and many of your games that you've tried to have clips on, you've never had to deal with an aerial ball. It might, to back to um, Phil's point, it might be beneficial for you to film yourself doing training of headers because if you're not getting to showcase your heading ability because naturally you just haven't had to have a ball in any of the games that you film, maybe you go out and show yourself, um, and I'm just getting to the point that you can take any film that showcases your ability as a player. So if you don't have headers in your video and you wanna set up a mannequin and show a few times you're up in the air showing your height and ability to jump, film it if, if it's not in the game. Until you get more games, because as Coach said, your tape is gonna be fluid. Maybe now in your junior year, they're just lofting big balls into the back. And as a defender, now you really get to showcase your aerial ability. 
now you don't need that training video anymore. But anything that allows you to showcase what you do based on the position, because if I'm a if I'm a coach and I'm looking for a center back, I want to see how they deal with balls in the air because that's important for the success of my group. I think just building off that is um, from my perspective and talking with a couple of colleges that came out to RNLS Next Games last year. Yes, I think you can include highlights from every level, um, but specifically on the boys' side, it's going to look better if you have highlights against Atlanta United, against Charlotte FC, because you're playing against the top competition in the country. Um, so you, I think, as to Stefan's point, your highlights should be as much as possible playing at the highest level. And then if you have a category, let's say you're a forward and you don't have any at this point you didn't have any goals. Let's say you have, don't have any hold up play, okay, as a fall. Okay, and that only comes from your high school tape. Absolutely use that. And then this season coming up, then you start building your library of hold up play. You start building up your library of um, running off shoulders, things like that. Um, but specifically for us, I think on the boys' side, it's incredibly important that you do have um, footage, footage of you uh, playing at the highest level. So for instance, Britton, who was a U19 for us last year, spent two years training with our first team. He played in the USL One games. Um, he was talking to, he committed to FIU. They asked for full training footage with our first team because that was class of the highest level that he played at. So even though it was training footage, they wanted 11 v 11 of seeing him against professional players. And then they can gauge the, um, his ability and what he brings to the program from there. So I think as much as possible, use the highest level that you have, but then back to that point, until you get all of your categories in that domain, then you can build up training videos, things you're doing on your own and stuff. So. Another, another thing, because highlights are where we get the first perception of you. Written emails, I'm the captain of this, everybody applying to Division One school is the captain of this, and we're an all-star of that, right? And so one thing that's super important is statistics don't always mean that you are the best player. And what that means is, you know, let's say you played a game as a forward against the bottom team in the league and you just absolutely had nine goals against them. And another player who happens to be in the Atlanta region where they scored one goal, or let's say six goals all season, but them six goals were against like juggernauts of teams. Those six goals sometimes carry more weight. Now, it's not to diminish that you have to play who your school asks you to play, or where your club asks you to play, but this comes back to what he's trying to tell you. Now, if you showcase talent against respected teams that people know are a high caliber, the likelihood is they'll say, well, if this girl can do this against this team, she will do well because we play in college those similar types of teams. And so video, 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 because video is what sparks, when I was a college coach, before I would invest my budget to fly and go watch you, I will watch a ton of video to eventually get to a point where I say, you know what, we've seen the film, the boxes are checked, I'm gonna go see her now in person. And that's when we ultimately make a, a decision about you. But the film is the, what, mm, this girl's kind of got something. And it's important. Question? So in terms of creating these videos, um, do you have recommendations on specific software? Is it easier to use or is it? Anything free. <laughs> <laughs> if, honestly, if you have an iMac, you know, and, and kids, uh, uh, I mean, I've seen my six-year-old son edit a video on an iPad. There's so many free things out there. Because look, at the end of the day, there's videos like Jordan, for example, he does video analysis for the first team. So when he puts together a video, it is, it's phenomenal. But at the end of the day, if I put together a video, I literally have an arrow showing who the player is, Bells and whistles don't matter. Once they know who they're looking at, and ultimately, is it a video that they can see the action? Because remember, the, the tough thing about a highlight is a highlight is like a reference, right? Everything's glowing. 
but we can cut the highlight off if we lost possession of the ball. But if the first five seconds were amazing, we can't really tell in the end because it's just a snapshot. So no real recommendation, but that just goes to say, do not go and spend $500 on a subscription to something that literally, you get that film and download it to your computer and go on iMovie, you can do amazing things on it. So specifically regarding like, you know, the cherry picking yeah. of opportunities or you know, showcasing your skills, do you see value and I know a couple of the highlights we put together, we show some instances where maybe his pass wasn't crisp or it was short and the recovery to stay engaged, to, to hustle back, recover the ball back? 100%. So for me, I evaluated player, and I still do on five categories. I evaluate a player's technical ability, their relationship to execute a skill. I then evaluate a player on their tactical ability. What decisions do they make with and without the ball? I evaluate a player on their psychology. What is their attitude to defend? What is their attitude when things aren't going right? How do they compete? I evaluate a player on physical characteristics. If I'm looking for a keeper, is this guy six foot two? He might spark, spark my interest. Is he fast? Is he agile? Is he quick? Is he slow? Then I evaluate people on intangibles, which is the quality that I cannot initially see by just looking at them. But when the game's going on, the person I thought that might have been my shining light because they fit all the physical, big, fast, tall, but lazy. But then I see, to your point, your son give up a pass and show the intensity and determination to win that ball back in that moment. That speaks volumes to me because now all of a sudden I know that yes, it's a mistake, but this kid will fight back to recover. So those moments do carry a certain level of importance as it pertains to showing the overall picture of the person. And I, I'll pick on him right now, you know, two kids in the back there, I used to coach my guy Chase. If he were to stand up right now, and you went to pick him as a soccer player, you would potentially look him over for a bigger, stronger, because in your mind he may not fit what you think. I'd pick him every day of the week to be a starter on any team I coach because he brings all of those things. So does his brother, right? It's just, that's the importance of the big picture. So have some of them clips in. Now don't have too many in because. <laughs> <laughs> this may be the last idea for me since we're on the, the topic of video. Again, this, this is probably parent and player together homework. You can go and you can watch any college game online. My recommendation to you is much like the, we're talking about the college coaches trying to do their due diligence on their end, right? See what you bring to the table in terms of other things that Stefan just talked about. I think it is hugely important that you do your due diligence on your end, okay? Watch some of these teams play. Again, get an idea what the level is. I told you, I watched Notre Dame versus St. Louis. Ooh, great game. Great game. Clemson versus Western Carolina. Two different teams. Okay? Watched a bunch of other games. All different levels in there. Get an idea. Some of the things you're looking for, too. Think about this. I played defensive midfielder. And the college I'm interested in, my number one choice, Jordan, they play direct. And they bypass the midfield. Every time. You're going to be happy with that. Amherst. And they won D3 national title, right? Amherst. Direct. I played defensive midfielder. I'll go to Amherst, coach. Okay, that's fine. You may be in the first 11, but you may never see the ball because they're going to kick it over your head every single time. Okay, so those are things you got to think about. Okay, you have to really I said, do your due diligence. Again, that comes with trying to put all that stuff together because at the end of the day, yeah, you may turn around. Yeah, Stefan, guess what? I got into my number one school playing soccer and you never see the ball because they play around you. 
because their style of play is different than your style. Make sense? Okay, again, yeah. ask us for help if you need our help. That's what we're here to do. Anything else? Joe, a question for you, Jordan? I am sweating, so I'm going to try and keep this short. But just to touch for everybody, I think is extremely important. Um, and I know I mentioned it to my, well, my to our 17s on the Zoom call we had the other night, is social media. I can't explain enough and emphasize enough how important social media is, okay? I may look older, but I was a freshman in 2013, okay? Social media was not prominent even in 2013, okay? I think I got my first Instagram account 2014 when I was 20 years old. I know everybody's on Instagram now at 12 years old, okay? Social media can help you get recruited. Social media can stop you getting recruited, okay? So things like, from a coaching perspective, things like Twitter can be helpful uh, because you can upload highlight videos. You can tag um, different coaches, different programs, things like that. Um, they can also be detrimental because um, if you're posting on Twitter, everybody can see what you like. Okay, and if your if your account isn't private or you are followed by a coach, they can see everything that you like. If you're liking inappropriate things on Twitter, everybody can see it. Okay, same thing for Instagram. I had this conversation with one of our players in the academy last year, posting silly, silly things on your stories. Okay, if your mother or your grandmother would question. Uh, you put it on your story, probably don't do it, okay? It's incredibly, incredibly important. I know, I know we shouldn't judge people, but the job of a college coach and a college recruiter is to judge you. It's to judge your character and who they're bringing into their program. So if I go onto my social media and I see Player X is um, in support of the program, Player X is sharing soccer things on his story, his or her story, but Player Y, who's maybe even better, He's out with his friends at parties. He's posting inappropriate things on the weekend. Those things are incredibly, incredibly important. When I was an assistant coach in college, I led recruiting for a while. One of my big jobs, I would follow every recruit that we were talking to on every social media platform. I'd add the Facebook, the Instagram, the Twitter. My job was to do my due diligence on every little piece of them to try and understand them as, as a person, okay? We're bringing you into our program. Um, what, what return are we getting? Can we trust you in a social scene? Can we trust you away from the field? It's important to understand that you go from, we always talk about representing something bigger than yourselves. We would like to um, you know, focus on that, for our players to focus on that at Tormenta, absolutely. But as you go to a college, um, I just looked, I was sat here looking, Clemson's Instagram, how many followers do you think it has? The men's soccer, 44,000, 44,000 followers. So let's say you're at that program or you're a player at that program, you may go overnight from having 300 Instagram followers to 3,000 Instagram followers. You now have Clemson alumni, you have, I'm just using Clemson because everybody knows Clemson, one of those schools, okay? You're, the world is ran by social media these days, so it's incredibly important that you carry yourself in a professional manner at all times, okay? Make sure if you are on social media, you're using it to help your recruitment and not to stop your recruitment, okay? Because it is the college coach's job they wouldn't be doing everything they can in the recruiting process if they weren't looking at your social media, if they weren't finding out exactly who you are as a person, what accounts do you follow? Um, and I'm sure we've all got stories, um, every college coach has got stories of recruiting a player, you really like them, mm, social media, I'm not too sure, they posted something inappropriate. Maybe they said something inappropriate, they reshared something inappropriate, whether it's five years ago, four years ago, important that your social media accounts are clean, okay? So just imagine, you're now representing a massive institution um, with 43,000 followers on Instagram. Are you able to handle that side of your social media? It's, it's such a big part of it, okay? It can be good and bad. Make sure that you are using it for the right reasons. It's incredibly, incredibly important. I'm sweating, so. <laughs> on that note, Brad, anything to add from your side? Uh, just use these guys as much as you can for everything. Um, you know, they are, there's so much knowledge right up here and also including your coach, uh, Ian, Tom, everybody. There's so many people in Tormenta nowadays that have previous, uh, either played in college and coached in college uh, and know, still know all the college coaches. So it's not just a one man show that you ask this one person that actually knows what's going on in the college scene. Everybody, there's eight to 10 people in Tormenta that you can get in contact with. And, uh, we can help you on your journey. So don't hesitate to, to ask. 
And then if one of us don't know, we know somebody that does, so we'll figure it out. Coach Mean, your last guy. I'm not going to say yes, uh, covered everything, so. <laughs> that was good listening. You lead the process. Yep. Yeah. You lead the Amin? process. Amin leads the process. Yeah. Amin leads the, Amin process. leads the process. He leads it now. He's in charge. In fact, you're getting here for two any, weeks. Anything at all, uh, just closing statement from all of us now, is you have to be prepared to also invest in yourself. Um, you know, Coach Jim has said it before, full rides are virtually non-existent. So if you're not in a situation where you plan to invest in yourself, if you're waiting for that university to just literally give you everything, a lot of us are gonna be waiting in vain. It just doesn't happen. So when a school comes to you and they say, look, we can get you to where you're paying $15,000 a year instead of 45. That is a great package. And I know it's easier said than done for everybody, but make sure that you're prepared to invest in yourself. And part of that investment might be looking at the reality of your situation. And this is the last thing for me. I coached junior college for three years after leaving division one. And I went to three national um, events. You know why? Because we had 14 full rides to give away. So we used to take each one of those full rides and maybe we gave out eight full rides. And then we took the remaining scholarships and just gave half those scholarships to two players. So we were getting rosters of 26. And I tell you what, for two years, many of those students were so debt free because junior college is more affordable, but what we were very proud of is not all the students making national titles, it was the level of school we were placing our players into after. So after then two years at junior college where you saved and saved and saved, and some people think going to junior college was an embarrassment. You're not smart enough. No, sometimes the level is great. But we were putting people in massive Division I schools. UCLA, Santa Barbara, Wake, Wisconsin, Notre Dame, Indiana, Western Illinois, top, top school. Right? I'm just saying to you, don't, there, there is a, You've been to Macomb? Yeah, there we, we've is been to Macomb. a university for all of you in this room today. You just have to be willing to give it a shot. Final word from you? No, no word. Final word is, let's get out of here. Now, thank yes. you guys for coming. Thank you. Let us know, we're here for you.